Hi guys, welcome to the um, ACE Premium Workshop. This is week one and um, we're going to start off with an intro to learning without labels and supervised learning today. Um, my name is Dr. Shazi Akbar. Uh, I'm a machine learning engineer at Altus Labs and I very recently finished my postdoc at U of T in the medical biophysics department um, and, and I was affiliate at the Vector Institute. Um, so the rest of the workshop will be played out with a couple of weeks on unsupervised learning and then we'll dive into weekly or semi-supervised learning in the last week. There will be practical sessions as well so we encourage you to look at the material before the practical session so that you're well prepared and um, let's start off with a quick outline of what we'll be covering today. So to begin with, I, I'm going to give a quick intro to deep learning in general, but it won't be a thorough um, breakthrough of deep learning. Rather, it will be specifically highlighting key um, components of deep learning that we'll need to know about in order to implement uh, all of our practical sessions and to understand the uh, learning techniques we'll be covering today. And then I'll go into the types of learning, which I also talked about during the Lunch and Learn, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more depth today. And then we'll dive into the deep unsupervised learning techniques, which is what you, what you guys are here for today. And then we'll end off with a summary. So um, I'm sure everyone has seen many variations of this uh, particular image before. But uh, what I want you to take away from this particular slide and what I want you to be familiar with is an, a deep learning architecture contains thousands or even millions of neurons. And these neurons are organized in a layer by layer fashion where the output from one layer feeds into the next layer. And um, we call this deep learning because the number of layers tend to be vast and they have been getting um, bigger as time has developed and as the field has developed and therefore can capture deep abstractions of um, the input data that you feed into the architecture. Speaking of the input data, it tends to be raw data because the architecture itself uh, learns the features automatically. And by um, iterating through all these different layers, uh, after our last layer, we expect the network to make some sort of prediction or decision based on the task that is asked to perform. So really that's a very quick two minute overview of what exactly deep learning encompasses. Now, when we get into the neurons within the architecture, we all know that each neuron will take a series of inputs from the previous layer. It'll combine it in some fashion uh, through the use of an activation function. And um, these inputs are also weighted and those weights need to be learned during a training phase. Um, so we're aware that uh, information is aggregated as we go deeper through our network architectures and this all kind of um, happens through a series of activation functions. So, so this is actually a small, a small snapshot of um, PyTorch which is the language that we will be using throughout the entire of, uh, this entirety of this workshop. As, and what I really like about PyTorch is that it kind of reveals some of the layers that are hidden away in some of the other deep learning frameworks. So here you can really see how the training framework works rather than just having a single train function. And in order to um, implement a lot of the loss functions we're going to look at, I feel like PyTorch is a really good framework in order to um, get some intuition about what's happening behind just the front end and, and using models off the bat and straight out of the box. Um, so if you're not familiar with PyTorch, I really recommend going to the website and looking through some of the tutorials. They are well written and there's some really nice examples there as well to get you started. Um, so we talked about neurons and an activation function and that we have a series of weights that we need to um, optimize in order to successfully perform a particular task. Uh, whether that be classification or a regression task. Now, because of the very large search space we're working with, with deep, deep neural networks, um, we do need some sort of function in order to, in order to navigate the space and to, really, um, and to really have some way of navigating our way to a global minimum within this space as well. And here, when we say global minimum, we mean um, the point at which we're making very few errors within the network architecture. Now, traditionally in a supervised learning framework, we have a way of measuring error because we have brown truth labels that go 
hand in hand with the input data. And that way we can measure how well our network is performing. Um, so one popular way of um, doing this sort of, uh, of navigating this particular high search space is by using a function like stochastic gradient descent, um, where, which is shown here where theta is the parameters within our network. And we can see they're adjusted using this um, descent function here, which is also weighted by an alpha term, which is how fast we're learning, essentially. And then we have our loss function here, which is taking the parameters, um, the x input, and the y labels that were provided during training. Now, the loss function itself, as I mentioned earlier, is a measure of the error that's occurring within the network, or rather what occurring after we've been through the network. And um, this line here is actually the PyTorch version of uh, computing this loss. So the criterion would be some sort of uh, Python function within your code. And you can see the parameters that are being passed in are the outputs from the neural network and the labels associated with that output as well. Um, and typically what would happen within this function is that we would compute um, some sort of uh, loss, some sort of um, mechanism for extracting the error between the outputs and the labels. So a widely used loss function um, in the deep learning field is cross entropy, and that's shown here for n number of classes. So you can clearly see here we have the ground truth labels as y here, and the predictions coming from the network as p. And you can clearly see that it relies on both in order to um, compute this uh, cross entropy. So what happens when you don't have this y term here? We can't just remove it because um, this function no longer stands when we remove y. And um, the reality is that actually gathering y in order to uh, gather y from the real world is very, very challenging indeed. And I'm sure it's not just me that's came across this, um, this problem, but many, many of you as well working in the field. So, um, why can be very difficult to gather when we're dealing with um, knowledge that is currently unknown. And this is a real example that I worked with at Sunnybrook Research Institute when I was part of the medical biophysics department, whereby we were analyzing images of breast tissue automatically and determining features that were indicative of recurrence of, of breast cancer recurrence. And that particular field, there's not much clinical knowledge to really rely on. So we were hoping to build a deep learning model which can extract all those features and properties which could help predict recurrence. And there, really, we can't get any knowledge from any medical expert. And furthermore, if we wanted to get some sort of knowledge, if not that particular knowledge, it's very expensive and subjective on whoever is looking at the material as well. And for, the, for things like survival prediction and other um, biological changes that you're interested in in order to prevent death, for example, uh, we can't wait for the final outcome and then measure it. We have to kind of get this information beforehand. Other cases in which uh, a Y is difficult to gather is anomaly detection. Again, you don't want to wait for something abnormal to occur because A, either it doesn't happen very often and you can't constantly monitor the situation or um, you, it's just too risky to wait till an anomaly occurs. And also, even in simple examples where we're working with, say, images of scenes, um, we often have, um, when we label something, we can label them differently depending on where we are in parts of the world, uh, depending on your lingo, depending on your style of speaking. You know, um, so this is a really nice example here. You know, is a Jaffa cake a biscuit or a cake? You know, some people would label it one or the other. And I think it's this is kind of a nice example of just how we talk in general and how we communicate knowledge between ourselves. And it's certainly not a Boolean yes, no, um, yes, no response we get from each other. Um, and therefore, in order to really use deep learning in the real world, we need to take all of these into consideration. So if all of this is really tricky, if actually gathering labels in the first place is very, very difficult, why even use deep models? And I think it's a very, very good question. 
first of all, we all know that deep learning has made significant um, advancements in the field and it's given us superior performance to some traditional uh, machine learning approaches, uh, whereby we've hand engineered features and then these are fed to classifiers such as four vector machines or random forests. So we know that deep learning performs better than some of those other techniques. Um, and we want to be able to leverage this as well. Um, and if we're, if we're talking about the discovery tasks that I mentioned earlier, sometimes we just don't have another option. We have little to no domain knowledge and we want to capture that knowledge. And we know it's very complex and deep learning models are just suitable for those kind of tasks where the knowledge is, is very complex and needs to be learned in some way, shape or form. Um, and you get an added benefit of learning those features automatically rather than trying to communicate um, that knowledge from medical experts and multiple medical experts. And lastly, um, you know, deep learning is an active field. It's constantly developing. There's some really interesting and novel techniques that are available in the field. And I think it's um, only natural for us to want to use the latest and the greatest technology that's available in the computer science field. So these are all really good reasons for using deep models in the first place. So now let's go into a, a little bit more detail of the types of learning we can perform, um, not just in deep learning, but in machine learning in general. So we've already talked about supervised learning. And here I've just given an example of what I mean by supervised learning, where each instance here is an image and each image has been has has a label attached with it so and um, you can see the labels underneath each image here so because each instance has its own ground truth associated with it we call this supervised learning and we could theoretically train up um, some sort of neural network using these labels provided so in unsupervised learning none of the labels are provided here and we have um no real way of uh, telling the cats and dogs apart unless we go into the pixel space and really try and capture those features that we talked about earlier. And lastly, um, in week three, we'll be looking more into this, but this is one particular example of weekly or semi-supervised learning, but there are many other ways to kind of show this particular learning style. So here I've grouped together lots of instances into what I call bags, so groups, and each group has a label assigned to it. And the majority of the instances within each bag or group are reflective of the label. So two out of three of these images are indeed cats. But some instances within that group may be incorrect. And this is the reality in a lot of uh, real world tasks and we need to adjust for these. But pretty much anything that doesn't fit into the supervised or unsupervised learning framework gets put into weekly or semi-supervised learning. And there's many other ways that we can approach this. And we'll talk about this in week three in a little bit more detail. So let's start off with the supervised and unsupervised learning to start with. Um, so here I've kind of just outlined um, a few properties that I think are suitable for each learning um, structure that I described. So if we have a supervised learning framework and we have a fully labeled data set and we're fairly sure those labels are really accurate, we can actually have a smaller data set than you would normally and the neural network should be able to learn something uh, fairly intelligent and um, give you some really accurate performance. But you're making the assumption that the training set is also similar to your test environment as well. So um, you need to be careful when you do even have accurate labels, fully labeled data sets and, and smaller data sets. And there are some downsides with that scenario as well. With unsupervised learnings, it, and you, um, you're kind of looking for large data sets, which may be unlabeled um, or the expense, they're expensive to label, therefore um, labeling them just isn't an option. And um, they're really suitable for when you, you're not really clear what you want exactly out the network, but you know you want to learn some general knowledge or model your data appropriately in order to perform several tasks later. Um, however, we do sacrifice that with moderate performance compared to a fully supervised approach typically. But again, that depends on the evaluation metric and if the test environment is similar to the train environment. 
So um, you can see that there's a slight overlap between the two because um, it's very unlikely to be the case that you'll have all of this list or all of, all of this list here, but rather a mixture of the two. So you really need to trade off and consider all of these different um, properties before making your decision about the learning um, structure that you're going to use. <clears throat> so um, first of all, I want to give some kind of outline about when you would use uh, unlabeled data and why it can be useful. So this is a really nice example here and um, showing you two labeled instances. So one is red here and one is blue. That's called um, the blue positive and the red negative. So if we're starting to learn a very simple classifier, we'll come up with a decision boundary here, which is shown in gray. But even without labeled data, um, if we had an idea of where points lay or data instances lay within this feature space, we can actually make some really nice um, intelligent, intelligent decisions and modifications to this decision boundary just to separate out these two classes. So you can see it's no longer a vertical line anymore, but it's slanted slightly because we know that there's clusters forming here and there's clusters forming here. And then with even more labeled data, we can make that decision boundary even more refined, considering we can go from a linear to a nonlinear function here. And we can really separate out data further, even just by knowing where these data points lie within this feature space. So even without labeling, we can actually leverage unlabeled data in addition to supervised learning. And that's often done in the field as well. So that's kind of a brief intro to um, what we're going to talk about and what we're going to explore in the next uh, few weeks. Now we'll get into a little bit more detail about the unsupervised learning. And so the next, uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to look at data compression and generative modeling, which I'll talk about today. And then in next week, we'll be talking more about clustering, deep clustering, and predictive networks as well, if we have the time. So let's start off with the data embedding, because it's something we're probably, we've probably all used, um, we're probably all familiar with. And it's the idea of projecting some very high dimensional space into a low dimensional space. Um, and obviously, by doing that transition, uh, that transformation, we're losing some sort of information. So the task really here is to preserve what's really important in order to distinguish between said different objects and throw away what's unimportant. Um, so here you can see our data set, which may be say images of fruit, and we'll have some sort of transformation function here, which will separate out these different types of fruit and essentially give them some sort of encoding or representation, which is that particular fruit signature. So we're mapping our raw pixel data or our raw data to some sort of one hot encoding so that we can look them up later or even so that we can see where they lie in a slightly lower dimensional space. And PCA is one of those techniques that we've all used, even for visualization purposes, when we have a high, amount, a high dimensional space and we want to visualize it inside 2D. Um, and the idea is that we have, um, we want, we have a high dimensional input data and we want to learn a series of um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues which um, preserve the most important information and also have the highest variance um, within our data as well. So this image here is actually a really nice way of looking at lots of data points in a, a particular feature space. And our first component that we extract from that data kind of captures what's, uh, what's most common across all of these data points. And then the second principal component is the next important, uh, is the next linear, uh, linear um, mapping there, which preserves the second most important information and so on and so forth. And if we continue with this, we can capture more and more refined low variance information within our data as we continue on. So, this is a really nice way of mapping high dimensional space to m number of load uh, m number of uh, orthogonal axes. <clears throat> 